Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Super. Thanks for coming. It's really nice to see so many people in Kalabumi. Uh, it's been a while since the last meeting we had here. So it's really nice to be here again. Uh, my name is Mael, and this is Divya. We'll be facilitating this session. And basically, this meeting was called today with the aim to get together again uh, in these intense times and to share updates on what's going on in the community. So it's really more like an update meeting. So different people will come on stage and give updates on different fronts. Um, and we hope to keep it, if possible, quite short. Uh, so we'd like to end latest at six, if possible. And so one thing important is that the meeting is video recorded, but not live streamed. So if there is a need, we might do edits, but we would rather not. Um, and something else is that because we're in a very intense time right now in Orville and there are very emotional contents that are spoken out, I, our invitation is really that we stay centered when we share and we do not, um, we try not to go too much into the emotions. Um, also because there are attempts right now to delegitimize the residents' assembly uh, as if we're not able to behave and I think it's really important that we manage to stay respect respectful and centered. So that would be my little invitation. And the first agenda point. So we have a few points for today. One is an update on the National Green Tribunal outcome with a Q&A session. So we'll have Navroz and Sandeep on stage, uh, who are the two petitioners. And uh, so that's the first agenda point. Then we'll um, look at an initiative about facing our challenges. More information soon. Uh, we'll talk rapidly about the RADs, the ongoing RAD and the next RAD that is planned and will happen very soon. We'll talk about the situation in the youth center. Um, many of you may have seen the mails received by ATDC, so there have been updates since then, so we'll have youth center members coming and, and talking. And that should be it. Um, and actually, since I think Sandeep is not yet back. We'll start with the RADs. Um, so as you know, there is a working committee RAD currently going. The voting period stops tomorrow. So if you haven't voted yet, it is definitely the time to do it. There is an in-person voting tomorrow in Solar Kitchen between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, and you can still vote online with all the usual voting means. Um, anything to add on that? Mm, some of you were very confused as to how to vote because you're like, oh, I thought we were going for individual members and then you don't know, like, if you don't click on yes or no, it doesn't appear. So if you do want to kick out individual members, click yes, and then you have the choice of members. And if you click no, you won't because, well, no choice, right? So that was just a little clarification. Um, but yeah, please vote. Um, none of us are very comfortable with voting people out because, you know, integrity and inclusion and human unity, but you got to do what you got to do sometimes. So please just vote. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Um, Natasha, I don't know if you would you like to, yeah, give us a little update on the TDC RED, which is next on the line. So, I give you the mic. Hello, everybody. So, I know this is, um, these RADs are a bit like, oh, another RAD. Um, so, I'm just gonna, I've put a few notes down because I didn't wanna go more than five minutes and I can be a bit all over the place if I just ramble like that. So, I'm gonna read, but the reason I've written a little bit more kind of a personal story 
and how it culminates in the RAD is because somewhere we've all got to feel that to be able to participate. And we've come to a moment right now where it's really critical that we participate. And so somehow it's really not about the technicalities of all that goes on and what we decide upon finally in that RAD, but it's really about Yeah, so for me it started in December when I just happened to be one of those people that was kind of, you know, one of the first few who was called um, when the JCB arrived in Bliss. And um, somehow, because of that incident, I kind of gained a reputation that I don't particularly identify with. I've also been drawn into all kinds of activities in response to what's happening around us. And this is really not propelled by some kind of knee-jerk reaction, but it really comes from a deep longing, a, a real kind of deep longing for peace, which I believe we all have at the core of our beings. And Somehow, thanks to this pause that the NGT gave us, I've had the opportunity and all of us have had that time to kind of contemplate this phenomena of what's going, around, going on. It's like, what? Really? <laughs> Is this true? And somehow we as a community, we're being shaped here by fear it like for me as a as a forester I can kind of look at it as the ecology of fear you know um, and the 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 whole ecology changes by the presence of a, of a predator and and somehow our reactions are are you know, very linear, and they're kind of like a, like a patash, you know, it goes boom, 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 like one thing to the next, and you're just like on this treadmill. But somehow, along with that, there is also, alongside that, um, you know, this has to be done, that has to be done kind of mode, there's also this thing of community. Suddenly, we're discovering our community, we're discovering love, we're discovering... Um, it's incredible how all these little groups have come about and how people are just willing to serve and put their best foot forward and these groups form, the job is done and you move to the next group and you're doing the next job and it's just, it's, it's really miraculous. So within this whole conflict, there are these nuggets of this kind of blissful state of community really. So it's, very, it's a very parallel process. It's not something that we're going to reach at some stage when all our conflict is solved. It's here and now, that peace that we're looking for. And I think all of us have felt this, but it's important for us to articulate it together over here and to acknowledge that In one way or the other, this, this, is, uh, th th this is something that has been, it's not new. It's been there within all of us forever, for our lifetimes, per perhaps from previous lives even. And um, so it's not all the secretary's fault. <laughs> but it's... It's come to a kind of a drumbeat that is really loud at this stage. And it's, it's a calling. It's a calling to participate, to be able to transmute this frequency into something that we have all come to Oroville for. That's what we're here for. So coming back to the RADs. <laughs> um, yeah, the original petition was filed in November, but because of our processes and our structures, it's kind of coming to pass now. It's the upcoming RAD uh, about the TDC, so it's really pertinent. We've already had three RADs which have been kind of 
thresholds that we've passed that weren't easy, were difficult, and the community is really ready for some positive action. And, and that's what we hope. So even though when the RAD was filed, it was about the office order, which kind of deems the, the current TDC Ill, to be illegitimate, but we need to go beyond that. It's not just about, you know, the legality of an office order or whatever. It's about the manner, it's about the spirit, it's about how we go ahead and how the RA can participate together with the new TDC that will come in the next election process. And this directive is vital. We have been very quiet and silent in the past and we haven't been so forthright. So it's the moment to do that and to voice our opinion and to be there. So I hope to see all of you. Thank you, Natasha. When is the first residence assembly meeting planned? Do, is this already to be announced or should people wait for the official announcement? Okay, so basically the invitation will come on Monday and you will know the date of the first residence assembly meeting then. Um, coming back on the working committee already, I just forgot to say one thing which I think is really important because we're at this crucial point and the end of the voting day is tomorrow. Um, it would really be great if we could all check with two or three friends who we know are not necessarily following emails, not necessarily involved in meetings and ask them if they participated. So that would be a little request. And Jasmine is agitating a flyer. Um, so I think, yeah, this flyer has been circulated in several communities so far. You might have found a flyer in front of your door. Um, and there are some extras. And because I think this all started a few days ago only, so people didn't have the time yet to go and, and circulate it everywhere. So if you feel like taking a few flyers and bringing them to your community, you can also do that. Any place where the flyers are, Jasmine, that I can... Okay, they are somewhere here. Oh, they're here. Okay. So before leaving at the end, you can come and pick some up if you want. We'll leave them towards the, end, the, the, the entrance. Um, okay, and then the next point is a crispy one, and it's the National Green Tribunal outcome. So I invite on stage Navros and Sandeep. At this stage, my brain has become a, like a sieve. So I always have someone younger who can remember things. <clears throat> so I'm just going to say a few words, then Sandeep. And then I think most of the meat of the matter will come with your questions. So the, you see, the National Green Tribunal has a status different from that of a high court. <clears throat> it stands all by itself and it has the mandate to look at any issues regarding any aspect of environment. And it has very broad scope for calling for, demanding any kind of records, documentation, evidence, people, histories, whatever. <clears throat> so when we first thought of doing something, 
we didn't know where to go. And people were talking about the High Court. But I think there are serious limitations with High Courts. They are bound within frameworks and structures and laws that allow them very narrow scopes. The Green Tribunal, on the other hand, as I said, can allow you to raise even vague questions. And the court can then look at the importance of it, the relevance of it, and then call for material to fill in the holes. So we said it is probably better to begin by approaching the Green Tribunal. Then you see the process is that in any case, if you don't like the outcome of the Green Tribunal, you can go and appeal. And in different states, there are different possibilities. But either you can then go to the High Court and appeal, or as in the case of Tamil Nadu, it is possible for us to challenge the decision of the Green Tribunal directly to the Supreme Court. So we thought that is probably a better option. So that's the Green Tribunal. Now what were the issues we went to the Green Tribunal with? First, what was our concern? Our concern happened incidentally, I think, to be green because the situation that we were presented with, confronted with at that time, concerned the possible destruction of forests. The youth center having already been demolished, the next targets were Dakali and Bliss, as we saw it. So we said, all right, here's a forest issue. So that was an issue, but at the back of our minds, our concern was wider. Our concern was a reflection of the political situation as it was evolving in Oroville, where, in fact, all authority and power was, as we saw it, being removed from the hands of the community, the residence assembly, and being usurped by an authority that was alien to Oroville, was ignorant of Oroville, and had been transplanted on Oroville by an outside authority, even if it was the government. Now you see, previous governments have also appointed governing boards and secretaries. But in all those cases, Without exception, the governing board, the secretary, were all people who had some previous association with either Oroville, or Sri Aurobindo and the mother, or the ashram, or something. This is the first time we had entities who were placed in positions of authority in Oroville, but who had no experience or knowledge or familiarity with Horrible. So, we were in that very strange situation of having to deal with strangers. Who, as we saw in the very first weeks of their uh, entry into Horrible, had misunderstood Horrible deeply. They saw us as a bunch of people they could push around they could dominate, they could dictate to, and they could basically work to take over the organizational structures that governed Oroville. So broadly speaking, that was the scenario we faced. I'm telling you this because at the back of our minds, although right in the forefront was the aspect of the prospect of the destruction of trees and that beautiful <coughs> forests in Dakali and bliss. Underlying our concern 
was this aspect of the political takeover of Oroville. So with that in mind, we moved the Green Tribunal on the green issues. And within the green issues, we brought out these other concerns by way of adjuncts to say that, all right, if you do have to destroy a forest in Oroville, who has the power to do it? If you do have the power to cut trees, who has the authority to demand it? How, in other words, is Oroville to be governed? That was the question, but not the direct question we put to the NGT. The direct question concerned trees. And just to digress slightly here, to our enormous surprise, the NGT order, despite our limited plea, has <coughs> delved, perhaps inadvertently, but deeply into these questions of the governance of Oroville, which, had, which actually it has no mandate to do. But it has pronounced on them. It has said, oh, but who decides? Who makes the decisions? On what basis are the decisions made? And when they raised these questions, they by themselves and on their own came to the issue of, oh, is there a master plan? Who draws up the master plan? Are things being done according to the master plan? How does the master plan feature, for example, in the decision to destroy the trees? How does it feature into the decision of what to build, where, and how? So all these questions emerged out of the court's own curiosity. We helped along a little bit by providing information. But the initial questions came from the court, addressing the logic of the situation. So to my mind, the one thing that has emerged from this, and in a very practical and firm way, is the court deciding that no further development can take place in Oroville until a due process has taken place, a due process which recognizes the master plan, which recognizes the groups, organization, and bodies within Oroville which can bring up these issues. And so they ordered a stay. Initially, now, right now, the point is that the stay governs the cutting of trees. No more tree cutting. Stop. The second thing is, and this is where the court has moved far beyond our expectation to say, okay, this is not merely a matter of trees. We want to know how decisions are made and on what basis will the decisions be made for the development, not just of trees or greenery, but the development of the whole of Oroville. This is far beyond our expectation. So that means now that we've been calling for this in the background for a number of years now, but the court has said, no, we want to know how you propose to plan without a detailed development plan. So please go back and create a detailed development plan. A detailed development plan, according to the literature of Oroville, and has been prescribed by master plans as well, is something that is drawn up. And first, it is placed before the community. So in our expectation, we expect a detailed development plan, which technically should be drawn up by the next uh, TDC, which is yet to be formed. And then we think within the next six to eight months, they ought to come up with a detailed development plan. That detailed development plan will and should, must be brought before the community. The community must reflect on that detailed development plan and then put up a plan for development. Now, Okay, while that process is going on, let's keep in mind the fact 
that for the last 25 years, or 20 years or whatever, uh, Oroville has been governed by a um, master plan, which was called a perspective plan. Now that perspective plan had a life expectancy which is expected to run out in the next two or three years. By 2025, it runs out. So in effect, by 2025, even that perspective plan will no longer be operative and we will have to, the next TDC will have to first draw up a master plan, then draw up a detailed development plan, and then on that detailed development plan, which has been discussed with the community, begin to implement it. So I just want to lay that out for the... Just in case you need. Thanks. Uh, um, for people who say that we have not been interested in the development of Oroville, but only in trees, you are wrong. You see how focused we are on having a proper development plan so that we have a city. That is our ultimate aim, right? So, um, one other thing that the adventure with the Green tri Tribunal has shown us is don't be shy to raise questions. India's judiciary is extremely enlightened. Sometimes they even take up issues suo moto which means on their own understanding of things, they decide that, no, no, wait a minute, these things need to be discussed. So they call for those items. Even if it's based on just a news report they've read in some newspaper, they'll say, oh, is this what is going on? No, 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 please come before us. So if you are honest, <laughs> they listen. Um, Anyway, I've gone on long enough. And I think for further details on what transpired at the NGT, what their order was and what it means for us, I will left Sandeep, who was the co-signatory with me, to talk. <laughs> well, that was very clever of you. Um. So that's Navroz in his pretty shirt. <laughs> um, so um, we had, when we went to court, we went to the tribunal with um, the plea that Oroville has forests, deemed forests. And these forests have a right to be protected. And even though the land records don't necessarily show that they are forests, they have a right to be protected. The other factor that the court actually took on on its own, Suomoto, was the very factor that if you have a town which is of a certain size, which, which will produce a certain amount of waste, you need a, a town planning clearance, an environmental clearance to show that the kind of destruction that's going to happen is going to be mitigated in some form. So, first we asked for the deemed forest, then the court took up the factor that uh, there is a need for prior environmental clearance. But in order to do this prior environmental clearance, which Tamil Nadu government gives us and the, and the Union Ministry of Environment gives us, we first need to have an environment impact assessment done on Oroville to show exactly what is actually going to be destroyed. But in order to show what is going to be destroyed, we need to know what we're going to build. The master plan doesn't actually tell us what we are going to build. It gives us a kind of vision statement. It shows us a dream of what we could have, 
but it doesn't show exactly which lands it's going to, we're going to build on, where, on which plots, how much, how much is the square feet area, what is the building sizes. None of this has actually been cleared by the residents of Oroville. And therefore, until we have that, we can't actually even ask for an environment impact assessment to be done. Because what are we going to ask them? Like, we're going to build some things here. Please give us an environmental clearance. They're going to be like, well, OK, so, but exactly what are you building? Um, so basically, the court took this issue up and said that this city specifically needs a en prior environmental clearance, and therefore it needs an environment impact assessment, and therefore it needs project plans, a proper project plan based on the master plan, and then we have to apply for an environmental clearance, and only once we've gotten the environmental clearance are we allowed to build. Now, the third aspect of this judgment is the crown. The foundation came to the court, to the, to the tribunal, and basically stated that uh, the Matra Mandir doesn't have road access. Um, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, and therefore, we need to create road access. And so the crown is there for this. Um, we sort of, we tried to show, we, we showed in court that the foundation website itself shows there's mobility access for disabled people to go to the Matra Mandir. So that, that was a whole other thing. But in essence, the court did notice that there's always two sides to a dispute and therefore allowed an exemption from the environmental clearance simply for the Crown Road. But even for this, there has to be procedure involved. You can't just go and build whatever you want. That's, that's not clearing a dispute. And therefore, they created this extra mitigation factor in which a joint committee comes down and has two months to look at exactly what is going to be affected. What are the waterways? What are the roadways? What are the forests? What are the lands that are going to be affected? And how those effects can be mitigated, either through reducing the size of the road or realigning the road. So much for perfection. Um, and and uh, through making bridges or making ways or saying, OK, this area can't be touched by uh, development. It could be either of these. So, and then the foundation is directed to specifically follow that report completely. They don't have a choice in the matter. So these are the three things that were brought about. The factor of the deem forest. The part of the deem forest basically that we showed that even if it doesn't have land records that, are, that show that it is a forest, Oroville's forests are still liable for protection. To this, the court replied saying that the, Oro the, the Forest Conservation Act does not allow for private lands like this to be defined as deemed forest. However, the court noticed that the mother wanted green spaces and forests and that Oroville residents had worked for the forest and therefore, the green spaces and forests and water bodies are liable for protection, even if not under the Forest Conservation Act. And therefore, we need proper procedure in place before building. And we cannot just destroy anything that we like at a whim and fancy. And that when we build, every tree that we cut down has to be replaced with 10 trees. These were the directions of the Green Tribunal. The mother said. The court saying the mother said. Yeah, that's what they said. <laughs> now, yeah, no, the, 
I think I think if uh, people, uh, unless you have something to add, no, then um, if anyone has any questions, now's your chance. I've gathered some questions, and um, I'll ask them, and hopefully that'll help clarify um, oh. some of the questions. Maybe some of you have on your mind, and if not, maybe. Um, you, you can add after this. Um, could you also explain if protesting in Oroville is legal or illegal? Is it considered protesting against the government of India? <laughs> really? <laughs> so, first of all, there's a whole lot of hibbidjibis about about uh, fundamental rights and all of that. But the more important thing here is to recognize, as residents of Oroville, you are an authority of the foundation. You have the right and you have the duty to stand against Oroville's procedures if it's being hijacked. That is not a question of rights. It's your duty. It's your obligation. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I got it. That is in Oroville. St if you're standing outside Oroville, the question is different. In Oroville, your residence. And in Oroville, the development in Oroville is the concern of the residents. Thank you. Um, uh, recently, we saw that a house uh, after the NGT, we all expected that um, the commission would come in place and then things would proceed from there. Can you explain why Mita's house was taken down, although it was on the crown? Well, from what I understand, for one thing, technically, it was not Mita's house anymore. So once she has left, Whose house was it? It becomes the foundation's house. So the foundation, in its wisdom, perhaps out of a sense of spite against us, has cut its own nose. Thank you. Um, can, can TDC demolish buildings that are on the radials and the crown before the commission's report? We hear that there is a plan on Monday to clear um, the youth center. Can you just give an um, overall view on what are the rights? So, um, one of the things that the Town Development Council has stated uh, actually misstated. Um, it says in the judgment here, the respondent is also at liberty to take action against unauthorized occupations, if any, strictly in accordance with the law in force. Now, I wish the Town Development Council would first uh, engage a lawyer and ask them what that means. First of all, as residents of Oroville, you are not unauthorized. You are authorized. The act authorizes the occupation. So this doesn't count. Second of all, it shows nothing about buildings. It's about occupants and occupations. The secretary of the foundation is supposed to help foundation, help this place by dealing with unauthorized occupations who are not Aurovillians. That is the aim of this sentence. And second of all, it is not a direction to the foundation to do anything. It is only clarifying that the foundation still holds the right, as it always did, to uh, deal with unauthorized occupants strictly in accordance with the law. Even there, there's a legal procedure. You have to give notice. The, it's not just you, oh yeah, they're illegal, so now I can do whatever I like. That's not the way it goes. 
and therefore they have not the authority to clear on the crown they have not the, uh, which are buildings and especially if people are living in there they don't have the authority to do so hi um just i'm intervening because there is something that's directly linked to this exact question and point there's a letter that is being circulated um we are going to circulate a sign-up sheet if you guys uh, would like to sign. Um, basically talking about that, how because of the NGT um, judgment that nothing is allowed to happen, whether construction or destruction, and um, that the NGT is not to be misrepresented. It's very clear. So if you guys want to add your name to that letter, the letter will be circulating as well as the sign-up sheet. It's also online, so if you've already done uh, signed online, please don't sign again on the paper, but yeah, so the letters and... Um, Can you give an idea of the content of what the letter is trying to say? It's, uh, the content is basically saying exactly what was just said now, that um, they're not allowed to destroy anything, that, um, and that they being the ATDC and the secretary, that nothing is allowed to happen. So that please just stop doing whatever you're doing. Yeah? So anyway, the letter is going to circulate. Normally you shouldn't sign something without reading it first, so please read it and then sign it, um, or choose not to sign it, whatever, but you're highly encouraged to participate. Um, one more question. I mean, I have actually a few more. Um, recently, uh, the TDC put out a note that all construction should stop as per the NGT. Is this true or false? I don't know. Um, I think the intent was that all construction related to public projects and being carried out according to somebody's idea of a plan should stop. Because the plan is yet to be made. That's one thing. I mean, I don't know if this also refer refers to your repairing your bathroom. If it's the project area, if it's talking about the project area, then it's talking directly about the crown road. So yes, there it doesn't refer to that. So then, if it's a general comment saying don't build anything, uh, it doesn't make much sense. The judgment basically refers to the foundation not doing anything. So the foundation does not have the authority, the secretary does not have the authority to put any signs, and the Town Development Council cannot authorize any development. This, I don't think, this is my personal opinion, I don't think that this has anything to do with, oh, I redid my key roof or, or uh, whatever. Yeah, here's, here's an opportunity for the community to be further educated. I suggest you carry on building. And if the foundation wants to do anything about it, they will take you to court. Um, the question of this NOC has been coming up. Uh, what what bu buildings that were built prior to 2010 when the master plan came, uh, a lot of the early, I mean, Matramandir doesn't have an NOC as was pointed out. Um, so how do we interpret this NOC business and what is the legality of it by an illegitimate TDC? Uh, here's an illegitimate TDC talking nonsense. What legality can you apply to that? The NOC is a community approved process. It's not even officially approved. It is just a general process that was created by the community. In order to take that with legal validity, one must actually be a town planning authority of Tamil Nadu or of India. The TDC is none. So this actually is not a... Uh, the NOC is an agreement between us to develop for the master plan and to take Oroville forward. It has not been used to stop or destroy anything. None of the NOC procedures we have in ATDC caters for destruction of any houses or assets. But also, 
What is the procedure? If DDC has a procedure for defining an NOC, let it put them put the procedure on the table so people know. There is no such thing at the moment, and but I think we should have. We should have NOCs. And the Town Developing Council or whatever must have in place a process by which A, for new developments, it puts, it gives you an NOC or denies an NOC. Not only that, but it is also duty bound for buildings that were built five, 10 or 20 years ago to inform you, you have an NOC, you don't have an NOC. It can't one fine morning come in with a bulldozer and say, oh, our records show that you don't have an NOC. That is not on. So I don't know how the community deals with this kind of a thing, but it calls for some action. There are other sort of things in place also here. One is that, that the TDC must come clean about which buildings in Oroville they think have an NOC and which buildings they don't so that we all have clarity on this, so that we can actually start developing and cleaning up this place. But more importantly, people get T and EB connection. The T and EB only gives you a meter and connection once it is understood that the TDC has given their approval. So whether they gave it on paper or not, a building that has been standing in plain sight over the years that has gotten money from the central fund and which has a TNEB or, or landline connection is known in Indian law as automatically having NOCs. Not having NOCs, but having permission to be there. There is a procedure then to actually take them out or to rebuild or destroy this. And, and, and just coming in with JCBs is not going to work. It's contrary to the law. So this is my last question. Uh, um, it came to our notice that um, some apartments that were uh, staff quarters in Sire were um, handed over by Sire at the request of the foundation for foundation staff. So um, it was discussed at this point with all the different groups um, dealing directly with the foundation, but these groups exist on behalf of the residents' assembly, whether it's SIR, whether it's FAMC, whether it's the working committee. So since a lot of these things are happening in isolation between the groups and we only find out after the fact, uh, some people put up a sign-up sheet requesting that any information to and from the foundation ought to be shared with the community uh, in preference probably to the group before any answer is made so that the collective wisdom and views of the residents are consulted. So for that, there is a sign-up sheet um, there, and uh, that's a request we're making to our own internal working groups. And now I'll let everybody else who have questions for Navros and Sandeep to take over, thanks. Thank you, Renu, for all these questions. Um, we did have one additional question that came. Do you wanna ask it, Divya? Sure. Um, my question is because that's what is being discussed is why did you guys go as two individuals? And not why, why is it not the residence assembly that went to court on the, you know, because that is something that is sometimes asked <laughs> that is a good question um, as I mentioned earlier one of our at least my motivation in going to court and dragging Sandeep along with me was that there was an atmosphere and an environment created in Oroville where it was difficult for people to express themselves. The atmosphere was such that people were speaking out, were being targeted and victimized. 
that is one aspect of it. The second is that despite that, I believe there was one petition which garnered 700 signatures. As far as we were concerned, that is enough of a statement by the community without specifically asking for anybody to go to court on its or anybody else's behalf. I think <coughs> Well, okay, I can say from my side why I did. When, when we have internal processes and we sort of in general are committed not to use external institutions, and the aim that I see is so that we grow our own internal institutions and those institutions are far beyond, far reaching beyond the conventional institutions that lie outside of Oroville's boundaries. That's the aim of it. But we have to at least reach the conventional boundaries. And what happened on December was way, way before, way, way below the boundary. Even in India, outside this does not happen like this. In a general legal process, there is uh, notices given and um, all kinds of setups first before this kind of clearance happens. And there was a complete abuse of power. And therefore, when such a situation happens where we are not, our institutions are not capable of dealing with the situation internally, when if I were to say something and the TDC were to say something else, we'd just be at loggerheads. We have to come to a point where we agree before we can move forward. But if I say something and the TDC says something and they have police and all kinds of uh, forces behind them, then there's a problem and there's a balance, uh, there's an imbalance in power. And therefore, the courts have been created to balance back this power. It is a setup created for the individual against the state, against an authority, against a foundation, against uh, companies, against big institutions. So this is why I went to court. Now the question of, you want to say something? Um, <clears throat> one, th one thing that mother had said was that freedom of speech and thought are essential preconditions for the pursuit of Sri Aurobindo's yoga. Now the question of whether the Residence Assembly can go to court in all technicality, it can. There's, there are no fetters on the residence assembly to sort of not do this. But the problem is that we would have had to wait six weeks because the only setup we have is the RAD and it takes a minimum of six weeks to make a decision. And I can't go to court saying I'm the residence assembly. I have to have the residence assembly's actual consent on this. So if we had a setup, a process by which this could be done, then yes. The Residence Assembly can go to court, the Working Committee can go to court, um, but since we do not have it, we, as individuals, we went. Thank you. Thank you for these answers. So now the room is open, the floor is open. If you have questions, please, Address them. Feel free to come and sit back. I think that's going to be our oh, water. Okay, go for it. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. There is already a question. Go for it. Um, uh, my question is regarding the DDP that you mentioned, Navroz, that the community should draw up. 
here, I'm on. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering because the Dreamweavers went through this process and apparently um, there are the um, what are they called? Vastu, Vastu Shilpa Foundation. Vastu Shilpa Foundations. Um, aren't they sort of working on a D DP that could help us? Don't they have the expertise to do that? And how does this interplay our the community coming up with a DDP and and it coming from Vastu Shilpa? Is the question. Yeah, I'm not sure of what the process is for Auroville to come up with a DTP. Vastu Shilpa or anybody else has made uh, outputs, discussions, and documentation which can all be used. But there has to be some form of official body which is a part of the planning process and as a part of that it actually comes out with a DDP which is an extensive document which will refer to and call on many facets and aspects of the Auroville community to participate in it. So it's not a matter of picking up a document, it's a part of the community participating in it. It's an entire process which is why I'm saying that normally a DDP would take anything from six months to three years. And it's just because that was an information that was published recently, it seems that so far the Vastu Shilpa Foundation uh, and, the found, and, and the Orville Foundation have not yet signed the contract. So um, there is the Dreamweaver's outcome that we hope will be used but so far, it seems that there is no yet assigned contract with the foundation on one side, the TDC, and on the other side, Vasto Shilpa Foundation. Just to add that there is a, the, the master plan mandates a general procedure that DDPs are going to be built. So first, there's a master plan, which is a vision document. Under that comes DDPs, detailed development plans, from that flows in uh, one-year implementation plans, and from, from that flows the project plans of each particular project. And now once you have a detailed development plan, that actually helps us to review the master plan every five years. And that process of review and DDP must be done by the residence assembly. It must be done exactly in the same way that the act has, that the master plan was created. That's what the master plan itself states. So it doesn't actually matter in the end who does the DDP. It must pass through the residence assembly first before it gets implemented. That is the procedure established, not by me, the master plan procedures. Yeah. Uh, one point here is that given the fact that there is no uh, TDP and we'll be waiting for years before a TDP might be formed by the foundation, I think it is high time that the community became proactive and through an RAD process, establish a group, a small group of architects, town planners, etc., mandated to create a detailed development plan. Sorry? So the next RAD will be moving towards creating a TDP. DDP. It's a kickstart in the process, basically, and then the process might be longer than that. So, if you have questions, uh, Divya is, I don't know where she is. Okay, and please raise your hands when, and unfortunately, I see it's already 5.40. Okay, many hands raised here. There is Edzard. So, my, my request would be that the questions, and maybe more importantly, the answers, stay short. Uh, um, because we have many people, and yeah, please. Thank you. Just very quickly, 
I think I can say, looking around here, that there is a huge, vast majority crowd which would agree with me saying that these two gentlemen deserve a big thank you and I bow my head. And that they did the right thing because we, with our slow, far too slow ARD per, um, schemes, are, we are simply too slow and they are doing fast action was needed. And I think we can say, please correct me if I'm wrong, that we fully authorize these two gentlemen as being completely by consensus here, were authorized to do what they did. Thank you. Another, another little question. As the current DDC is a, a few people, there were supposed to be a minimum of uh, nine or 11 people. There are two or three. None of them is elected or selected by the community. And we are working on dismissing them and finding a new group which are selected and backed by the entire community. Now, if the present DDC, which is not having anything to do being authorized by the wider community, is issuing any threatening letters, NOCs or whatsoever. And after we have been enlightened by the two of you, by the legal means, which the secretary lady and the small group of psycho funds actually do not have, what are the best cause of action if they con try to continue to act on this group, which is actually a dysfunctional group? Thank you. So I have I have a question to ask uh, to Navros and um, it's me Bertrand here. Yeah. Hello Navros, Sandeep. Just one, one little moment, Bertrand. Maybe. Oh, there was a response. Is there anything you just want to say in response to Hazard? Uh, let me just say something to Please that. Do. I think apart from contending and non-violently uh, stopping uh, illegal demolishing, what we can do is right. There's a thing about writing is that it's out there. It's on record. When, when we went to court, the court asked, so how did the residents feel about this? And we were a little bit like, uh, because we didn't know how to show that there are a whole lot of residents supporting this, supporting the movement to stop the development on the crown um, from the stay that we got in the NGT. So, it's very important for residents of Oroville to write. It can be short, it can be your feelings, it can be legal, it can be authoritative, it can be whatever, but you must write to the TDC, you must write to the foundation when you find that things are not in order. That's very important. Go for it. Uh, the, the question is to the matter of the, the Green Tribunal, does the judgment apply to the entire master plan that is land that don't belong to Oroville or does it simply apply to the land that belongs to Oroville within the master plan? In other words, as the people that own land in the master plan are affected by the judgment in the same way as the foundation is. Well, anything the court says to Oroville obviously applies only to that which you know belongs to Caesar. What doesn't belong to Caesar, Caesar can do nothing about. <laughs> what? All this area is not concerned by the judgment. Is that correct? Green Bay. The green belt is in the master plan, but any lands that we don't own, the foundation doesn't own, be it ma in the city area or the green belt, we don't have jurisdiction over to make any judgment. Now, when we make the uh, detailed project plans, the foundation has been told to decide whether those plans are for the lands we don't own or the lands that we do own. And based on that, we get the clearance. Correct. Always, yeah. Uh, 
Okay. One question more. I read the full. Um, I'm here. <laughs> I read the full uh, uh, sentence of the Green Tribunal, and I was very curious about this interpretation and proposal related just what we just said. How do we develop in detail the plan, considering the land that we already own, or considering the view of mother that include the land that we have not yet? Since I came to Auroville, means almost 15 years ago, my feeling that I want to share right now, considering the inclusiveness and considering this uh, joint committee that the Green Tribunal is already forming and the collector and so on, I was reflecting, it is the case that we form as well a committee to work together with them in the big scale, in the view of mother means also land that really legally we don't possess, but are part of our by origin, belong to this area, belong to this land, belong to these people that daily work with us. Is it possible? <laughs> and the dream waivers can be part of this commission. Thank you. Sorry, are you referring to the joint committee or are, we, are you referring to what we do? No, no, the joint committee and uh, I was thinking just because there is this uh, group, the Dream Wave, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, I refer just to the joint committee plus some Aurovillian that are already a build up group, you know, the Dream Wavers made by our architect and to sit and discuss aspiration of territory, goal of territory, our aspiration, how we can melt. This was the idea. Uh, sorry, but you see the committee that the NGT has formed has a very, very small and limited mandate. It doesn't cover anything other than the crownway. <coughs> Only that. So you, we can't bring other wider issues concerning Auroville, its neighbors, the bioregion, into this. It's separate. But you're right, I mean, we have to address that wider issue as well. Hmm. So it's me. So I have a question, not to you, but to all of us. So very soon there will be vacancy in ATDC, in working committee, there are vacancy in the council. We need people in housing service, in housing group. Who is going to step up? Because we are talking, but then when there is a selection, very few people come up. So it's time to resist, but from the group, not outside. Thank you. It's time that we all own the responsibility of what's going on also and that we step up in building Orville. Uh, Mita. Yeah. I just want to um, say three things. Uh, one of them, uh, it was from the NOC point. It's just a minor point maybe. But just for the record, uh, the extensions that Tapas and I made in 1996 and in 1999 and then what LOD did, the bathroom and their house, all had temporary NOCs. We did have NOC, it's not that we didn't have it. We had it, but it was temporary because at that time, the planning group, I, th I mean the development group it was called, was only giving temporary NOCs. In fact, we all know from that time, it was a big joke. Everybody had tempor only temporary NOCs. Very few people had permanent NOC, so we were part of that. That was just a clarification for the record. Then my, say, my question is about the joint committee. And we have the collector. And I heard that the collector was right, uh, I think the NGT judgment came out on Thursday. On a Thursday, I can't remember exactly. The collector was with the secretary on the Friday. This is what I heard in Bharat Nivas. And I want to know 
how how much can will that joint committee actually work and actually do that it's not just uh, you know a faff that you know how will we make sure that the joint committee really uh, you know has the input of uh, the residents and will really make sure and can we make a uh, a committee a bit like uh, what Rosalba said for that part to work with the, to say that on behalf of the residents these people are also going to do that study and give that to the joint committee and this should be on record that the joint committee considers the in all of these places so that we make sure that you know the other like Darkali the rest of Darkali is protected Darkali had an alternative, beautiful alternative. Um, Mahi had made beautiful drawings. So, you know, that has to be, um, you know, uh, respected or something. We have to do something about the joint committee that it actually does the work. That's my second point. And my third point is, you know, uh, we've come out, there's been a list of 40. It's not just what happened to our house, it's 40. Uh, structures. There's a list of 40 structures which are supposed to be, quote, demolished. Right? I think you have, many of you have seen this list. Have you seen this list? It even includes Earth Institute and so many, you know, all of sincerity practically. All of that is on the thing. So I think that we have to say what kind we, as the residents, we need to either update the master plan modify, be, uh, you know, that it has to be updated. All of these things are assets which we created. Our civilians created with so much struggle, you know, a, so much struggle we went through to create what we have created. And these are assets and should not be demolished for some, uh, you know, idea. Some people are convinced of some wacko perfect circle and other such things when actually I know, I mean, yeah, mother would want us to find the best solution. You know, together, exactly. The whole point is that we work together to find the best solution for everything. And, and uh, yeah, they sh and, and our house should never have been demolished. Maybe it could have become a crown building. That's why we were holding on, you know, why not? Why demolish? And, and it's no, we should say no, sorry. All these things, it doesn't make sense. And you don't put a line of force on a water body. That doesn't work. We have to find a solution, we have to find some other solution. So I'm all for finding a group of people that we authorize, we say all of these flashpoints, we get a group of people, we have got Prashant, Lata, Suhasini, you know, so many people we have who could actually be authorized by us to look at this thing, one for the joint committee and two for all of these things for the master plan to say to find an alternative. Mm. So um, I, at a practical level, you don't need authorization from anybody. If you want to do it, you do it. And I suggest you put a note out in news and notes or wherever, inviting people to the first meeting <coughs> to prepare materials to hand over to the NGT formed committee. You can't sit here and do that. If you wanted to form the group here, you can do that here. No problem with that. But one is that. And the other thing I was thinking of forgot <coughs> was that on this NOC business, it needs another committee, an ad hoc committee of citizens, which asks the foundation office and the TDC the questions you want to raise. What is the NOC? What happens when the NOC was not given? Why were NOCs not given? Give us a list of every building in Oroville which has an NOC. Give us a list of every building that does not have an NOC along with reasons why NOC was not given. If NOCs were denied, that is something separate from NOC was not given because it just fell off the chart somewhere. So all these questions you have to raise. Form a group, five, ten people start and go. 
Thank you, Navros. Just a little point on timing. So there are two more people. Is that what you're saying? Okay, great. Uh, it's 6.05. We said we wanted to finish by 6. So I'm just checking with the room if we can stay 10 more minutes. We'll take the two remaining questions that Divya has in mind. And then uh, we'll just go to one or two last points on the agenda regarding updates and then we'll close. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Super, thank you. Go for it. I'm on. My question is not necessarily addressed to either Sandeep or Navros, but rather to all of us. I have a lingering doubt in my mind regarding how to really stop the present actions of the foundations and the secretary yeah. in its tracks. I think that's why Wiseau left a bit in frustration. And to me, there's definitely, sorry about that. To me, there's something very important about the numbers that we are. I know that when we've acted in the past in numbers, we've managed to achieve a lot. And I'm wondering, frankly, if Monday, if there is a call, who will come? Who will come? And I believe that if we all come the way we all came today, here, that a lot can be achieved. A lot can be achieved not only in terms of us as a... Of us as a community, because I've, I've always believed in that strength of the community. But also, I believe that if anything does happen, and if we are there in numbers to stop them, first of all, I believe we can stop them peaceably. And second of all, I think that they will have to rewrite their scenario, that it's not going to be that simple. That's it. Thank you. I also hope we can all be there on Monday if there's a need, or in the following days. Um, so, hi, I have a question about visas. I don't think it's necessarily tied to the NOC or whatever. I'll stand up. But, um, like, it's a major concern whenever we stand up for something that, as a foreigner, we have visas. They are fragile, as seen in the past. Recently, there has been youth that have been either completely denied visas or have gotten three-month visas. Is there something that we can do as the residents' community, or is there... It does the, is there the right? Do they have the right? Does whoever, um, is it allowed to give or deny visas in this manner? And is there something that we can do as a community to stop this kind of uh, playing with the visas? Because it really does affect us all in a very personal level, especially when we're trying to stand up and speak or voice our opinions. Um, thanks for the question. I can actually tell that there are actions being taken right now regarding the visas, as far as I know. Um, I think there might be updates soon. Let's hope for good news. Uh, at this point of time, it's very clear that uh, the way the Foundation Office is issuing visas is not in compliance with uh, actually the, the, the law. So, so we are hoping that action can be taken. Now let's see. Um, yeah. That's we all, all of us who are foreigners in this country have a consul. The consul represents us in this country. If we write to the consuls and we tell them that we are being denied visas, at one point there will be too many of these stories and it will create such a, an issue that it will be an issue. Already consuls are bringing this up with the secretary. And I know from, for as a valid fact that if there is enough different consuls that start hearing about this, it will no longer be, oh, one country or another country. It will become a huge issue between that transcends us just here in Oroville, because... So I would advise anybody that has any issue with the visa, write to your consul, because there has to be a record. If we all are afraid and quiet, that's how they have the power. I just would like... 
I just would like to uh, add for the record, simply because this whole thing is being videoed, and there are Indians and Tamilians here. I think you should support our brothers and sisters who are foreigners, and they should not be treated like second-class citizens just because of their visa situation. And just to add to that as well, I think there is um, a letter, a draft letter that has been circulated that is basically a model that you can use if you want to write to your embassies or to the consul. So um, we might, I, I, I saw that pass somewhere, I, I could find it again and maybe uh, that could be circulated again, that just to build up on what uh, Yona was saying. Um, there is one last question actually. Um, and then we're closing the topic. My question is about uh, that we heard, with in, including the letter of the ATDC, that because of the judgment, now they have the right to proceed with Crown Road, and that's why they demolished one building, beautiful house. Uh, because based on the judgment, they have taken an action, can they now appeal the judgment? Because we are also hearing that the rest does not suit them, so they want to appeal the whole thing. But as they have already taken an action based on the judgment, legally, I imagine, that they have no right to appeal it anymore. Yeah, just one aspect of this appeal. An appeal has to rest on some substantive ground. And again, it's a very subjective and personal reading of the order that we might have. And we see no substance in the order that gives them any kind of comfort. I don't say that merely to say uh, what a good order it was for us. Which it was. But, see, uh, one other thing that came to my mind was if they have been saying that they, i.e. the Aurobel Foundation, the Governing Board and the Secretary are Aurobel, then why haven't they gone to the Supreme Court? Why have they not gone to the Supreme Court? They are the first injured party but they haven't. And this in part to answer a whole lot of questions that have come up here. And I wish to reaffirm that it is not them. But this assembly, the residence assembly, is in charge. Just to... Um, just to I, in the end, we can, you know, argue about whether the whether they can ap appeal or not, but uh, it's all academic. It's all under the discretion of the Madras High Court or the Supreme Court of India. And they will decide whether an appeal should be allowed or not. And that is if the foundation does appeal. Generally, there is a time limit. Um, but in which case, uh, they would also, if if they were to act legally, they would also have to submit that they have gone and destroyed a building based on the NGT. And then say whether, uh, then the Supreme Court says whether an appeal is allowed or not. But that's... Thank you for this clarification. And I think we can close with the NGT topic, which took qu quite a lot of time. We have a last point, which was a little update from the Youth Center on how things went since these email exchanges with the ATDC. So I'm just wondering if a member of the Youth Center team would like to... Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Hello, everyone. So um, any one of you aware of the email that has been sent to Youth Center from the ATDC? Uh, in short, for those of you who haven't read it, we've been um, asked to kindly dismantle all the unauthorized uh, buildings, uh, structures. Um, 
we have posted this email on Oronet, and we've also posted the, our o official reply from the Youth Center team to this email. I hope you read it. It was lovely. Um, <laughs> so we try to basically ask them what do they mean by unauthorized structures. And um, in short, um, today we've met with Anbu and with uh, in presence of one of the Orville Council members, Surian was there, uh, with me, Manolo and Deep. And um, he had come to the site and said, oh, okay, well, there are no new buildings built on the crown, I see. Um, so what is this mail all about? He was generally conf genuinely confused about it, so we went and took the meeting and it proceeded to the ATDC office. Now, I'm not sure if, um, if it's yet, this is, this is where my confusion comes in from, from the YC side. Um, we've had the meeting just this afternoon or morning, and uh, we haven't yet finalized the minutes, but TDC is closed tomorrow, so if we send them a request to you know, approve our minutes and compare our minutes, on Monday they come. So I'll tell you in short, um, basically they've informed us that this order came from the foundation. Um, but I would also like to add that the email, if you read it carefully enough, they do not state that they're going to come with JCBs. They're just, they're just saying, kindly dismantle all unauthorized structures. And uh, in meeting, they haven't once mentioned that they're going to come, only once when I asked, are you going to carry out that order? Did Toby actually say yes? And it was asked later whether that refers to 70% of Oroville, and the reply was yes. And there was a bit of <laughs> small argument there, <laughs> but it's going to be on the meet, uh, on the minutes. Um, so in the end, uh, we are in the situation where we don't act, again we don't know. We are under huge um, time pressure. We don't know what's going to happen on Monday, so we're just taking precautions. We've uh, also asked the TDC at that meeting to um, please um, consult and discuss with the foundation once again because four-day notice is a little bit ridiculous. Um, to dismantle YC, <laughs> so they've uh, Surian has asked to to just give us more time to to talk with the ATDC and the foundation, and maybe we can find some way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Um, that's that's the update. That's the update. Basically, uh, from my side, I just want to add that. Um, I'm very grateful for Navros's and Sandeep's inputs in this. They've given me a lot of, and, and the YC team, I hope, who have been here listening to what they're saying, a lot of um, courage and hope. Because um, knowing what had happened in, in the past, in December, um, it, it, anything may happen. And, and as Divya correctly said, you, you got to do what you got to do in the end. You got to stand there and say, look, you, you're not doing the right thing. I'm sorry. And if they push you, they push you on what, what to do. Um, so uh, there was the question from somebody, who will come, right? So you can all come, just just don't get handsy, you know? <laughs> You'll be provoked. I, I'm pretty sure this, this whole thing, from my perspective, it's, it's a giant provocation. And uh, it is imposed onto youth because we are seen as these, you know, reactive personalities, young and unaware. But we're not that, so we're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one more thing I'd like to add. Um, there was that topic of Matri Mandir not having an NOC. That was quite funny. Uh, but Toby did say that it is in the master plan, so <laughs> it's not going to be dismantled because it's in the master plan. Well, the vocational training center is in the master plan. It's just that the ADDC at the time didn't give us the right plot. So this is where I guess if we do talk, this is where we'd have to start that it's not our fault of our generation where we are in youth center right now and uh, we do not, I mean, we will uh, comply with any legal requests, but uh, illegal requests we will decline and object, which we did object. We sent a legal mail yesterday evening as well, uh, objecting and forwarding it to working committee, foundation, uh, council and FAMC, objecting um, the email. And that, that's where we're at. We hope you come if something's happening. <laughs> um, one more thing I'd like to add, because um, there was this topic of visas and, and fear and all this. Uh, thank you, um, Yona, who said, contact your consulate. Um, um, 
if you guys, fellow Orvillians, can help me out, you know which uh, state my country is in. I'm, I'm from Russia. Um, consulting my consulate <laughs> might send me somewhere else. Um, so I'm not going to do any of that. And I do have kids. And I, uh, officially, I'm still a child of Orville. I'm 26 year old child of Orville with children. Uh, I'm going to be there. So. I hope you will support us if anything happens. Otherwise, this is just a big farce and we are tired of it. <laughs>